right, thank you to the singers there. It is great to sing about God. And uh, thank you to Drew for, uh, he puts a lot into our worship team, guys. He is putting the schedule together, uh, inspiring us. Uh, I'll just have to tell, I mean, he almost like made up a new verse to how great thou art there. And uh, I'm sure it would have been maybe even better. Uh, but I, I know that Drew is, I would say, out of, excited out of his mind for this Wednesday. That would probably be an understatement. Uh, but the worship night is something that I know it's been on his heart. It's been on Beverly's heart. It's been on uh, Martha's heart for a long time. So it, it's going to be amazing. So I pray that you're here and really ready to, to worship, to give your heart. We're going to have a testimony as well. And we're going to have some scriptures uh, read. But really, the whole idea is for us to get closer to God. Amen. And if you're anything like me, you, you tend to read a lot, pray less, and sing at church. And so uh, this is really going to help all of us prayerfully uh, get closer to God uh, in a great way. Um, so let's say a prayer as we, we get started into our sermon here. Uh, Father, we do uh, thank you for this time to worship you, God. Whether we're uh, here, uh, God, I pray that you get our mind on you. I pray that you touch our hearts today, God. Get me out of the way. I pray that your word will speak to us, God. God, I know that you want to light a fire in each one of us to help us to be closer to you. God, not one that's, that's lit from outside by someone else, but that's lit by you in our hearts, God. I pray that you use uh, these next few minutes to do that. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, well, today the title of the sermon is The Hope of the World. And if you haven't figured out, this world needs hope. You know, Danny prayed about the, everything going on in Orlando. You know, you don't have to, you can think about San Bernardino, you can think about Paris. You can think about your co-worker. You can think about the state of your next door neighbor's marriage. You can think about your kids. Whatever you need to think about, but this world needs hope. And if we don't have hope, I don't want to be here. And the good news is, is today that we have it. And we're going to get to look at it today. Hopefully my clicker is going to work. I don't know that it is. But we'll, uh, th this weekend we had a time with the teens. Uh, grateful for all the teens and your families there. We went with seven uh, of the brave boys. Uh, with a couple of the dad, me and uh, Rick went. And then the teen leader guys, Kevin and um, Gabe. And it was an amazing time to be up in Joshua Tree. You, you can't really see that too well. Uh, but you get the idea. That was our campsite. Uh, if you look kind of right over here. Uh, I think it right back over here. That's where Ramon and uh, and uh, Dylan slept. They slept kind of outside. They had a tent, but they they thought it was cool to sleep in a cave, kind of underneath the rock. Uh, they had sleeping bags, but for whatever reason, they decided not to use them. <laughs> and so uh, Ramon was there in his two T-shirts. Uh, you know, D Dylan at least had I think a long sleeve shirt. But it, it, was, it was really a lot of fun. Yeah. We went uh, bouldering, uh, which is basically when you hike without a trail. So you just kind of go from rock to rock. And uh, believe me, all you moms, it was, it was very safe. <laughs> it was extremely safe, uh, at least until the point when they lost me. And then we, we had a good talk about making good choices, <laughs> not going beyond what you can do, and don't do things just because other people do it. And then they just went on their own. I'm looking up and seeing them up there jumping. I see my son jumping from rock to rock like a mountain goat. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the whole time, I'm literally praying, God, please help no one get hurt. <laughs> Uh, Cliff, Cliff and Kathy are going to kill me if Landon gets hurt. Uh, and so everybody made it back, okay. And uh, we had a lot of fun, made some great memories. And, uh, you know, they really inspired me as well for this sermon, really thinking about the hope of the world. And looking at each one of them as we had our quiet time outside today and just thinking about, the, the, they have no idea 
what God wants to do with their lives. They're here in a valley and, you know, they're awesome kids. But, you know, as all kids are, our dreams are usually pretty small compared to what God wants to do. You know, maybe you can relate as a non-kid. But we tend to think of what's right in front of us and whether we're feeling good or bad in the moment. And I'm, we're just thinking like, wow, God can change the world with these seven kids. Yeah. He already did it with 12, but I think he can even do it with seven. You know, we had 11 of us there. Not that that was some kind of perfect number, the disciples without Judas. But just thinking about... Uh, God can change the world with as small a number as he needs he said he would save Jerusalem for one person you know what can he do with your life what can he do with not just our kids life but with yours but turn over to Psalm chapter 60 when I go like this that means to change the slide uh, you have shown your people desperate times you have given us wine that makes us stagger. But for those who fear you, you have raised a banner to be unfurled against the bow. This doesn't sound like the hope of the world. It, 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 it kind of does and it kind of does. It says that God had given his people desperate times. God gives us whatever we need to turn to him. It says he's given them wine that makes them stagger. That's kind of an analogy that he uses in the Old Testament a lot of times to basically say, I brought hard times on you. I made you struggle. I made you go through some things. But he says, for those who fear you, you have raised a banner to be unfurled against the bow. And if you think about like Iwo Jima, I mean, they raised the banner on top of the mountain because they won. That ultimately, in the trials, God wants to give us victory after victory. Amen. And wants us to be able to raise his banner and say, God did this. <clears throat> and it wasn't about how great we were, but it was about God. And that's what his people were experiencing, although they were staggering at times. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, God? You who have now rejected us and no longer go out with our armies. You know, honestly, this was the verse that really inspired me for this. That they were going out to fight God's battles and they were losing. And they would come back and they would just say, wow, we just got, our, we got kicked in the teeth today. What happened? God's not going out there with us. He says, give us aid against the enemy for human help is worthless. They started depending on themselves. They started depending on how great their armies were. They started thinking about all the great victories that they used to have. And they weren't thinking, they weren't focusing on God. He says, with God, we will gain the victory and will trample down our enemies. Point number one is simple. God is the hope of the world. Amen. You could call it simple, but it's true. God is victorious in everything that he did. There's never a time when God said, you know, I lost. You know, that plan wasn't a good plan. Or no, that was a mistake. You know, God never has those days that we have. Right. He's hopeful every single day. No matter what happens, no matter what, how much we sin, no matter what the world's going on, He's hopeful every single day. And He's faithful. He is certain of what's going to happen in the future because yesterday is like tomorrow and it's all the same to Him. It's a, it's a fact. It's a reality. You know, can you imagine Jesus getting up in His day and going... Oh, man, I hope I just make it through this day. I just can't wait to get through it, man. It's going to be rough. Can you imagine Jesus going up to his weekend and saying, my weekend is so packed that, I mean, I'm just starting it and I just feel like, oh, I'm going to have all this stuff going on and then i got to go back to work on Monday. I mean, can you imagine Jesus and yet we do that? Yeah. We do that a lot, don't we? 
Oh, man, I got to go to work another time. I got to do this. I got to do that. Jesus never had a day like that. Never. Every day, he was the hope of the world. Here's a little, I'm not a math major. I was a sociology major, but I hope this works. God equals victorious, equals faithful, equals hopeful. So when we're godly, we are victorious, faithful, and hopeful. And when we're not godly, then we're not victorious, we're not faithful, and we're not hopeful. I thought that was pretty simple. Come on, Scott. You know, uh, what was happening when David wrote that psalm? Let's look at that. 2 Samuel 8, turn over there if you will. Got to turn some pages here. You're with me out there, right? You're still there. Okay, we're talking about the hope of the world, so you're getting... <laughs> The hope of the world, I guess I'll just take it. it the hope of the world, it, it's not you. Okay? Don't worry. It's not you. 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 It doesn't depend on you. Although you're involved, it's not about you. That makes me feel better. Okay? Take a deal. Okay, we're feeling better. He says, in the course of time, David defeated the Philistines and subdued them. And he took Metheg Amma for the control of the Philistines. David also defeated the Moabites. So the Moabites became subject to David and brought him tribute. Moreover, David defeated Hadadezar, son of Rahab, king of Zobah. David captured a thousand of his chariots, seven thousand charioteers, and twenty thousand foot soldiers. When the Arameans of Damascus came to help, David struck down 22,000 of them. He put garrisons in the Aramean kingdom of Damascus, and the Arameans became subject to him and brought tribute. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. This is what was happening when he wrote that psalm that we just read. Remember that? You're not going out with my armies. You know, you're, you're, you're opposing us, and you're also raising up a banner. David didn't just go out and it, was, it wasn't just all easy. He had to overcome with God. God put him in desperate situations so that he would rely on him and ultimately see the victory. I mean, he defeated the Philistines, the Moabites, another king, the Arameans. He captured like 100,000 people. And yet in his mind, he was saying, you know, God, you're not going out with our armies. Why? Because it wasn't easy. They weren't having victory every single day. But in the big picture, it says, in the course of time, David did all this. It wasn't like every single day. But in the course of time, God did amazing things. In the course of time, when you stick with him, Amen. he's going to use us, his church, over and over and over. Next slide. Just to remind, that's what he was writing about. We're staggering and yet we're victorious. Yeah. You know, you've shown us desperate times and yet all these people are serving us and bringing us everything. And you're bringing the wealth of the world to us and yet we're struggling. Does that sound like anybody? Next. Turn over to Psalm 65. And you can look at the blue verse. That's the one that inspired me. You, the hope of all the ends of the earth. He says, you answer prayer to all people who come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and will bring to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds, God our Savior. The hope of the ends of the earth. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. From the beginning to the end, everywhere on the earth, God is victorious. He is the only hope 
of the world. Anything else we look to will prove to be false. And in the end, it won't be a question, who is the hope of the world? He says, you forgave us our sins. He was the hope of forgiveness. Only person that could ever forgive is Jesus. That's right. No one in this room can forgive you. Your parents, they can't forgive you of your sin against God. Right. Of your sin that put Jesus on the cross. But, G but God can. It says he, cho he chose you to live near Him. That God would go through the ends of the earth to choose you. And you, and you. That that's the God that we serve. You answer us with awesome and righteous deeds. You know, I got to thank, uh, James and Wendy did a class this past uh, Wednesday for the teens. And, uh, you know, it, it was kind of good and bad there that he did that because, number one, he, he didn't really do the class that I wanted him to do. He, I gave him the note, the chapter in a book and he did something totally different uh, so you know that's kind of always interesting when people do that right is James in here oh there he is right there so you just kind of run with it I, I told I did give him license I said you can do this or you can do anything so I do give him that and I was amazed at how God used them it was way better than the chapter that I thought he was gonna do so amen but he asked us to share our answered prayers. And I just started, and it hit me that I forgot so many prayers that were already answered. So the next day for my quiet time, I just sat down and said, you know what? I'm going to just write down all the major prayers. I mean, I wasn't even going to deal with the minor ones. Just the big prayers that God answered in my life based on that. So thank you, James. Uh, I hated you, but I loved you. <laughs> so I just went through and just thought about my conversion. So just think about when God brought you to Him. Just those last few months, or, or whatever led up to that, how He showed Himself to me. How He answered my prayers, and some of them were ridiculous. How he, The people that He brought into your life. And then the people that He had studied the Bible with you. Yep. You know, it was so amazing. The guy who invited me to church, I could not stand. I literally, I mean, there was like 50 people on my football team, and the number one on my hate list was this guy. He was a terrible football player. He didn't like the United States, which is a big deal. He didn't like my kind of music. He was just not my guy, okay? You get the idea right there. And yet God used him to invite me to church because he was so radical. And then once I started studying the Bible, he moved him out of the way, and I pretty much studied with this other guy constantly, and I never really studied with him because I needed to get my heart right. Anyway. He puts the right people. He answered prayers. He answered prayers that I didn't even know people were praying. Even my dad said he was praying as I went off to college. I mean, he's even claiming his prayers were answered. I mean, they, they were. The, the, fan, the friends, the, you know, as I was, you know, the, he showed me what true friendship was. I've been looking for that for like my whole life. He showed me what family was all about, what a godly family looked like. I had never seen one before. He helped me to understand the truth about baptism, what it was, what it wasn't. And I had all these people telling me that this church is a cult as I was studying the Bible. And that they're too radical. And they're too committed. And they actually believe that baptism saves you. And these guys are crazy. And I said, you know what? As I look at Jesus, so was he. He was pretty crazy too. His parents thought he was crazy too. He was pretty out of his mind. He didn't even have a house. He didn't even have anything, a place to sleep. He gave up everything. And God answered all those prayers just for that one thing. When was the last time you thought about all the prayers that God answered for you to become a Christian? All the prayers that God answered for you to get you here today. 
And there were so many more. I don't even have time. There was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Awesome. Those were the big prayers. I'm not even talking about, you know, he gave me that parking spot and, you know, he did all these little things. <laughs> People that he put in our life, opportunities that he give us. You know, my mother-in-law, that was one of the big ones. She was dead for about five or six minutes. Her assistant was driving her to the hospital and she was literally dead. Nothing. They got her to the hospital. She somehow revived. And they thought she was going to be brain dead and then she wasn't. And then she was fully herself again, lived another five years, and got, back, got restored to God right before she died. Amen. It's like, wow. That was an amazing miracle. What else do I need God to do to show me His power? You know, I won't even get into all that, but you can ask me later. But I, really, I want you to think about yourself. What are the prayers that God has answered in your life? And do you appreciate them? Do you thank Him for Him? Are you grateful? Do you feel like, man, that's enough? God is, I look at this, I go, that's enough. If God didn't answer one more prayer, that would be more than enough. I could be good. And yet we want more and we want this and we forget and He answers them and we don't even remember. We're so ungrateful at times of His awesome deeds that He answers us. He's our hope. He's been our hope. He has heard our prayers. Yep. How does this relate? You're wondering probably. Uh, well, every, every, uh, everybody has their movies that inspire them, right? Yeah. Well, I got a, a bunch of them, and you know, one of them is, is Gladiator. And so a, a couple weeks ago, I think it was on holiday weekend, you know, they caught me at like 10 o'clock at night where I have all those cool movies around 10 o'clock at night. And I started watching it and, and this was like transfixed. You know, my, Danielle walks in, she's like, you watching that again? It's like the 15th time watching this movie. And I'm like, shh, shh, I got to hear this. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> And Commodus is asking his sister, he said, what is the glory of Rome? They're talking about it. And, and I never caught this part. He said, she, she said, the glory of Rome is an idea. It's an idea of greatness. It's an idea of victory. It's an idea of glory. And it hit me. That was kind of the inspiration for this sermon. See, Gladiator is really useful. Come on. A lot of us, we've lost that. Yes. You know, I, I really don't care too much about the glory of Rome. But we've lost the glory of God. We've lost the glory of His church. Because it's an idea. It's a faith. It's a glory that God has of greatness, of power, of victory. And yet we just sometimes, we just go to church. We just go to church in Little Valley. And yet God is great and He's awesome and He's changed the world through this church and yet we don't think about that. Because we've lost our faith. Some of us. I know I had. In the greatness of God in the glory that he wants to do. Which leads me to my second point. Jesus is the hope of the world. Jesus, the hope of the world. When God wanted to give hope to the world, what did he do? He gave us Jesus. That was the most amazing thing he could have done. Of all the things that he already had done, he gave us Jesus to give us hope. From the day he was born, to how he lived, to how he died, to how he rose from the dead, to how he started the church, hope was everywhere, every day, every minute, every event, every interaction, every prayer, just teeming with hope and thousands of people 
name. You know, Martha sent me this ne uh, next slide today. But that's the scripture that I thought of when I thought of Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For I am gentle and humble in heart. I'll give you rest for your souls. That people came to Jesus and they were in need. And they left Jesus. And they were full. They were filled. That there's not one person that came to Jesus that went away not satisfied unless they didn't believe. Every single person. Wow. Every single person in the world who comes to Jesus and has faith will be filled. That's the hope of the world. You know, we have so many people in here who bring hope every day. I have to mention Martha was sending out this scripture. Every single day I get a scripture, I get a text, I get a picture, I get something. Awesome. I'm lifted up. Yeah. It's encouraging. Most days I read it. Probably 95% of the days, Martha. <laughs> I read it. Martha. You know, we have so many people like that. I mean, I was thinking of Lewis. Our, our good dentist. Yeah. That he brings hope to the world every day. He works super hard and is joyful at work. And man, he's got so many things going. Yeah. You know, I thought of Xavier. Yeah. Man, he, he, you inspired me. By your faith. By your perseverance. I thought of Sergio. Yeah. Wow. God has a special room planned for Sergio. I mean, he's got an amazing heart. I thought of April Rubio. You know, and she has changed and grown in her faith in the last six months or year. I mean, it's really inspiring. You know, I thought of Abraham. You know, a PE teacher with faith. That's inspiring. He's trying to help people and figure them out and loving on them and helping them graduate. And I, I thought of... Uh, Carlos Mendoza and just you know when we were, had this meeting with the singles and everybody was sharing their heart and Carlos was like man I want to Chantal too I mean I want to help I want to step up I want to I was, I was good right there I was ready I was like man because when you're hopeful and faithful you want to step up you want to lead you want to do something you don't want to sit back if you're sitting back, you're living the most boring Christian life. I don't want your life. And guess what? No one else does either. When we sit back, we are not the hope of the world. When we wait for someone else to step up, I mean, we're just kind of looking for someone else to be the hope of the world. That's not inspiring. But what about my needs? I need to get my needs met. You know, when you come to Jesus, your needs will get met. You know, when you refresh others, your needs will get met. I'm not saying forget about your needs, but I'm saying don't forget about Jesus. Don't forget that He is our hope of the world. I thought about MJ. I know she got some of her family out. I mean, just an amazing story. MJ's so fired up, isn't she? I mean, all the time. She's... I mean, when she tells you about something, you just feel like, man, this is going to be the best thing ever. <laughs> it could be just like the kids' kingdom dinner, and you just feel like, man, this is going to be like the president with the banquet with the president. Yeah. You know, because she brings that zeal, which is awesome. And I appreciate that gift, because uh, I don't have that gift like you do in that way. So my question is this. Uh, what is God going to do to bring hope to the world? What does he have to do? Does he have to send a hopeful message? I already did that. Does he have to write a book? Yep, he did that too. Does he have to give us an example? Did that too. Does he have to give us the truth? Does he have to prove it? Does he have to make us desperate 
Does he have to answer our prayers? He's already done it. Some of us were looking for God to do it, and he's already done it. Where were we? This brings me to my next question. Really, this is the question, I, if you forget everything else, this is the one I want you to think about. How is God going, going to... Oh, to do. That's, uh, that one. I copied and pasted that. So how is God going to use me to bring hope to the world? That's the question. How is God going to use me to bring hope to the world. In Psalm 45, it says that the writer was stirred to a noble theme. When, when you follow Jesus, you will find out how He will use you to be the hope of the world. Someone who is not following Jesus will never bring hope to the world. They may do it for a short time, but not a lasting hope. You got to rely on God. When you're humble, when you realize that His way is way better than mine, Amen. when you realize that I don't know where I'm going and what I'm doing, but I know who's leading me. Amen. When you repent of all the sin that gets in the way of you being the hope of the world, because a sinful Christian is not very inspiring. How is God going to use me to be the hope of the world? You know, this week I was at a car dealership and uh, I went to sit down and it was early in the morning and I didn't really feel like talking to anybody. I don't know if you ever get, get that way. I just felt like, man, I'm ready to just go down, sit in my chair and do my stuff, read my Bible. And, and the guy I went to sit next to, he had a... It said United Church of Christ on it. He was wearing a, a shirt. And so you feel like, wow, okay, if this guy's wearing a shirt and he's sitting right next to me for like 15 minutes, I probably got to talk to him. <laughs> Being a minister and everything, that's probably a good thing to do. <laughs> so we started talking, and he started saying um, the church he goes to, United Church of Christ, uh, it's, it's a not really too similar to our church, but, it, you know, it, they believe in Jesus, but they're very liberal. And so he started, so how did you get into that church? And he starts telling me, and he said, you know, 2013 was a big year. That's the year I left being a minister in the Methodist church and was a minister in this church. And the year me and my partner got married. And so he leads a church in Palm Springs. Uh, he's openly homosexual. And so here I was, not really wanting to talk to anybody, and here's this guy. He's all out there. And so I'm sitting there thinking like all of us would think, what do I do now? What do I say? Do I say this? Do I say that? Do I ask him if he's ever read Romans 1? That was the first thing that came to my mind. Hey, you ever read Romans 1? You might want to go take a look at that. I decided that's probably not a real good way to do it. <laughs> Uh, he starts telling me about our church. He's heard of our church, so he knows that we're super strict on sin. So I'm going, okay, he's expecting me to just like totally just bring out the sword and just start carving away right now. So I was just talking. and So what did I do? I invited him to lunch. Amen. I said, how about, uh, let's go to lunch. Me, you, and your partner. I want to hear how all this happened. And I left there thinking, what the heck did I do? How is this going to go? Come on, Scott. Come on, Scott. Come on, Scott. But we're either the hope of the world or we're not. Come on. Come on. I have no idea what's going to happen. It's going to be very interesting. I'm sure. But man, maybe he's going to be the one to lead his whole church to be disciples. Amen. Maybe he'll be the one. If we can't convert people like that, then we're probably not going to do all that God wants us to do. If you think about the hardest person in your life, why not them? God doesn't have hope for them. 
He doesn't think they could change. I mean, you could change, but they can't. I mean, I changed, but now they, they can't. Come on. Right, come on. Come on. The hope of the world. There's no doubt. Don't be a chicken. Be the change, not the chicken. I got to close out, I know. God calls his church and me to be the hope of the world. You want the hope of the world? Sad as it is, it's us. That's us. You guys, right here. That's the plan. Guess what? That was always the plan. And that always will be the plan. Using imperfect vessels to share His glory. Amen. 2 Corinthians 4 calls us jars of clay. We just hold the treasure. 2 Corinthians 12 said that when we're weak, we're strong. Powers made perfect in weakness. You are the light of the world. That's the plan for our church. You know, our church is around the world. What's the plan? That's the plan. Our growth is slowing down around the world. What's the plan? That's the plan. We're not any greater than people 100 years ago. I wasn't going to go there, but why not? You know, when I, came, when I started coming to this church, we felt pretty good about ourselves. We felt like, you know, those churches back in the Reformation days, I mean, they really expanded and grew for like 30 years, and then they died out. Remember that? That was one of the speeches. Oh, the mainline church, you know, then the 50s and 60s and 70s, man, they grew like wildfire, and then they died out. And now we've been going for 20, 30, 35 years, and guess what? Same thing. Yep. Come on. Same thing. We're slowing down, guys. Right. So what do people do? People over here, they go, you know why we're slowing down? It's because we're not committed. It's because you're in the third soil. It's because you love money and you love your jobs and you love your kids' sports more than God. Why are they saying that? Because they're afraid? Because we've never been to this place before? Because we're nervous? Because we used to hang our hat on how fast we were growing and now we're not as much. We're growing a little bit. Then you have people over here that say, you know, you know why we're not growing is because we're too rigid. We're, we're too conforming. We're too strict. You know, we need to like loosen up. We need to like give people more freedom. We need to just redo everything and make it like relatable to the new generation. It's got to be friendly to the next generation or it's not going to do what it did. You know what? I think that's crazy. Amen. I think both of those things are crazy. <laughs> I don't know what the answer is, but I know it's this. Amen. I don't know what we're doing right. I don't know. I do know what we're doing right. I don't know what we're doing wrong. I don't know what we need to fix. Believe me, if we knew what we needed to fix, we would have fixed it. Come on. I need to be the light of the world right. today. I need to be the light of the world tomorrow yeah. and the next day. I don't know. I don't know what's next. Neither do you. But I do know this. And I do know I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. And God's going to do amazing things again. He will. Amen. It's not a new idea. Right. I'm going to save my last bit for another time. Since the 1800s, people have been saying, and even beyond, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. You can go read it in, uh, in your quiet time, 2 Timothy 3. It said that the church is God's household. The, ho the, the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Go ahead to that one. Next one, I think. Okay. 
The pillar and foundation of the truth is you. Is God's church around the world. The truth is in His Word and it's lived out in you. The hope of the world. That's what Jesus started. That's who you are. That's what people have been saying. This is not a new thing that we're going through. Go look. Go do an internet search on the church, the hope of the world. Everybody and their brother talks about it. And one thing is clear. Go ahead to my last slide, please. Dear church, you're still the hope of the world. I pray that today that you have grown in your faith. I pray that today, tomorrow, and the next day that you ask yourself the question, how is God going to use me to bring hope to the world? When we have people into our homes, we, we shine a light. They've never seen a marriage like yours that's filled with Christ. When you talk to them about your dating relationship, they are shocked that you're pure. When you talk to them about being married and loving each other, the world doesn't have that. Having a hope for the world is something that is very special. I pray that as we take communion that we think about that. That Jesus died to bring hope and I pray that we'll be those vessels. Amen. And we won't give in to fear, but we'll be faithful vessels. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time to be together. Uh, God, thank you that you've given us more than we can ask or imagine. Thank you that you have a place prepared for us in heaven. Thank you that you gave us your son to bring hope to this world. To save us from our sins, to save us from ourselves, to give us a vision. To give us a light. God, thank you for his body and his blood that was broken for us. God, I pray that today that we can let go of any sin that holds us back. We can let go of any lack of faith that holds us back. We can let go of any of ourself that holds us back. God, that you can use us in a powerful way. We love you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.